Bibles, please turn with me to Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16, we'll just read one verse to start with. Verse 9. A man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. What's on my mind is the fact that we all, uh, we man makes many plans, plans for his future, plans for how to defeat the enemy. We, we make all these plans, but, but the Lord is the one that directs the way. At this point in, in 2 Samuel, David is king. But his son, Absalom, has tried to take over the kingdom. And David is now in hiding while Absalom is trying to, to rule and reign the kingdom in his father's stead. And um, as Absalom is getting advice, he gets two different uh, counselors' advice. And uh, we'll, we'll look into, Lord willing, how we should make plans. But we have to make plans in the light of God's direction. Because we can make whatever plans we want, but if it's against God's direction, it will fail. So, you know, you have a ditch on one side where nobody ever, ever consults God or plans anything. And then you have a ditch on the other side where we plan everything as if it's all up to us and we don't even consider God. And we think we've got it under control because we have all these plans. Well, the truth is we need to consult God and look for his plan and then he will grant us guidance as we make plans in the light of his direction. But here we have Absalom who is not serving the Lord. He has just overthrown his father unjustly as king and he's getting um, direction from counselors. And the Bible tells us that in a multitude of counselors there is safety. So. That seems like a biblical thing to do. He's got two different counselors, and they give him two different uh, plans of attack to defeat his father, David. The first one tells him, let me go and take some of the best men that we have, a certain number of men, and I will find him where he's at. And the, the other people around King David will, will flee. They, we won't harm them, and we'll kill just King David and we'll bring the other men back, and they'll join us, and we'll all be one happy family again. That was the first advice that King Absalom got. And then the second advice was, no, this is not a good idea, because you know your father, he is a mighty man of war, and him and the men that are following him are as bears that were robbed of their fruit, and they're going to be angry, and they're going to be even more powerful, and what, what I counsel to you is that you, King Absalom, you need to go to the battle. You need to take all the men and you go to the battle. And there's a, there was one verse at the end of these two counselors of um, advice to King Absalom that had me pondering what we're discussing tonight. So I wanted to go ahead and start with that. 2 Samuel chapter 17, verse 14. And Absalom and all the men of Israel said, The counsel of Hushai, the archite, is better than the counsel of Ahithophel. For the Lord had appointed to defeat the good counsel of Ahithophel to the intent that the Lord might bring evil upon Absalom. It's that last phrase there. The Lord had appointed to defeat that good counsel. The Lord had def appointed to defeat the good counsel of the first man. The Lord did that, that the Lord might bring evil upon Absalom. So no matter how uh, good our plans are, no matter how much we plan and we devise it out, and man, it's a perfect, good, worldly, wise plan, if the Lord is not in it, the Lord will destroy that plan. So that, that's what was on my, my heart. But I do want us to consider... Uh, before, before we go into attacking an enemy, is really what, what's on my mind is how we plan to defeat the enemies, the enemies in, in our community, uh, the enemy of the devil, the enemy of uh, just the flesh inside of us each day. Sometimes we come up with a plan to defeat that flesh in us. We come up with a plan to defeat the enemies around us, the enemies of God, and that can be defeated if we're not seeking the Lord's guidance, and if the Lord is not guiding. But let's take a moment, and I want you to consider where you're at today. 
did the 18 year old you or the 10 year old you would would that person have ever thought that things would have gone the way that they have for your life so far i know with me i would have never thought that i would in any aspect that i would have been where i'm at right now and i know several others that they never would have would have been able to envision or plan out the way that god had designed for their life to go so we need to seek the Lord and guidance every step of the way. But I just want to rejoice in the fact that the Lord has a better plan. The Lord's way, sometimes we can't see it. We might be in a valley right now and thinking, what in the world is there any good in what's going through my life right now? I can't see why this would happen to me right now. But the Lord has the, the vision all the way through to the end. He's got it all figured out. He knows the paths. We can come up with whatever we think our life should look like. We have our starting point and our next achievement point and our next achievement point and whatever it is, defeating the enemy or in excelling in our, our business or in our family. We have all of our ideas of how it should go and the straight line upwards that we think it should go. And the Lord's plan has hills and valleys, and there's a purpose in it all, and it teaches us. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 15. Some of the things that hinder us is we put our trust in worldly things. We, we have a plan, and we put our trust in that plan. Things like riches, things like um, our stored food. Those are some natural illustrations, but we also think of our wisdom and our education and how our past experience. We think we've, we've got this next thing up ahead because I've already handled that before. Consider the children of Israel, whenever they were entering into the promised land, and they were up against the great walled city of Jericho. Well, they were fearful for them. They, they had an understanding in their heart that they could not come up with a plan that would win. But they sought the Lord, and the Lord gave them a plan that would make no sense to any of us in our flesh of marching around that city for those seven days, and then, and then marching around seven times and blowing the trumpets and, and screaming. And We would not have come up with such a plan. But they followed God's plan and won that battle. And I believe many of them became prideful after that. That was one problem. And there was at least one man who broke God's commandment after he delivered the city of Jericho to them. And he took some of, that, uh, some of that spoil from that town and hid it away. And that was against God's command. So then they come up to this next town, the town of Ai. And it's much smaller than Jericho. And then they start to think, we have this now. We can come up with a plan ourselves. And we can defeat Ai without seeking the Lord. Y'all see how we can do that so fast? One minute they were terrified of Jericho and, and obeyed God, and God blessed them to defeat Jericho. Then there was sin in their camp, and they didn't address the sin in their camp. That alone will defeat your plans. You can have the best plan in the world for the next thing that you think God would have you to do to defeat these other enemies around us, but if there's sin in your camp, I don't care how sinful the other man is, the Bible talks about how if we will not repent, how if, if a nation will not repent of their sins, a land that's worse than them, that's a, that's a more heathen nation than them, will come and take over that land because God had blessed that land and there was sin in its camp. So there was sin in the camp of the children of Israel and they didn't address it and they became prideful and didn't seek out the Lord and they just sent a few men to Ai. And there was, a, there was a disaster that happened, and men died because there was sin in the camp, and they got prideful, and they didn't seek God's plan. So consider that. Proverbs 15, look with me at verse 22. It is good for us to seek counsel. I want to establish that first because the devil will have us jump to the opposite ditch. We do need to seek counsel. We do need to make plans in the Lord. Proverbs 15, 15, verse 12. I'm sorry, verse 22. Without counsel, purposes are disappointed, but in the multitude of counselors, they are established. Turn with me to the New Testament, Luke chapter 14. 
while you're turning to Luke chapter 14, consider how Jesus told the people that were following him, they were asking him about when the end of Jerusalem would come, when the end of that world would come, and when these disasters would come. And he says, you can look at the clouds, and you can see the storm is coming, and you plan for that storm. That's a good thing. He's not saying that that was a bad thing. You can see the storm coming, and you plan for that natural storm. But his rebuke was, but you, you can see the signs all around you of this spiritual storm, if you will, of this um, judgment coming, and you don't prepare for the judgment of God. You prepare for that, that cloud that's going to come rain on you, but you don't prepare for the judgment of God. So it's good for us to plan in the Lord, for us to remove the sin in our camp, for us to consider what God would have us to do next. Uh, look with me at Luke chapter 14, beginning in verse 25. And there went great multitudes with him, that is Jesus. And Jesus turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Let me pause there. I, I believe that those two verses, I almost didn't, didn't plan to read those, but the Lord directed me on how important those verses are. Because one of the things that messes us up in our plans is our motivation for our plans. I believe sometimes we make plans for the sake of our love for our spouse over our love of God. Sometimes we put our family members above God. And we'll make a plan for, for that person that we love in the flesh more than we love God. And that plan will fail. We have to, do our, we have to move forward for our love of God and to glorify God. And sometimes that will hurt the closest family members you have to you. And then he goes on. It's not just loving your father and your brothers and sisters and your spouses more than God. We love ourselves more than God. And we make plans, this is probably the most often mistake we make, we make plans for selfish gain. And we are good at lying to ourselves. Y'all know that? Everyone in here knows what I'm talking about, I believe. We lie to ourselves and say, man, we're making this plan so that we can glorify God. But if we search our heart, God knows our heart. And if we search our hearts way too often, we are planning these things and fooling ourselves into thinking it's for God, and really it's just for ourselves. So that's the caution that God has for us tonight in those two verses. We need to die. For us to carry out God's plans, we need to die to ourselves every day. Mortify this flesh every morning that we wake up. Every day we have to kill it again, because it'll rise back up. Mortify all the desires of our own flesh, and seek the Lord in His direction. Look with me as we continue. So Jesus tells them, You can't love your father and your family and yourself more than me, or you won't be able to follow me. Take up your cross and suffer with me daily. Verse 28. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, whether he hath sufficient to finish it? Lest happily, and lest happily, after he hath laid the foundation, and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Y'all see the, the direction in the, Lord, in the Lord in a natural sense, that you don't go and build the house, start building the house without a plan. It is good to plan, but we better plan in the Lord. That's natural. He's, come, he's going toward a spiritual message. Remember the, the beginning of this is there are multitudes of people following Jesus. And he's telling them, you better, you better count your costs. You better plan. You better understand the plan ahead before you continue to follow me because there's going to be a cost. You're going to have to lose family members. You're going to have to die to yourself. You're going to have to bear your cost every day. That's the real message. That's the spiritual message. But the natural illustration, illustration is there. You don't build a house without counting your costs for it first. But more importantly, whenever we follow God, we better count the cost that is given to us and the plan that's given to us in the Word of God and understand 
that all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. The cost of serving the Lord is great. We will lose. We will die to ourselves. Hopefully, prayerfully, the Lord will fill us with his spirit and we can declare like Paul that all those achievements... You Think about Paul for a second. How Paul had a plan for his life whenever he was Saul. And man, he was moving up in that plan and he was high up among the Pharisees and the Jews and everything was going according to his straight line plan that he had to serve the Lord in, in a way, to serve God the Father. I believe he thought he was serving God the Father for a time until the pricks started coming. And those pricks came and consider the cost of him obeying those pricks and turning his life around and, uh, and losing all of that stature he had as a Pharisee of Pharisees and all of those plans he had for his future he had to go down to nothing and be hated by all these people and suffer shipwreck after shipwreck and jail time and, and ultimately dying for the cause of Christ. But it was worth it. He declared, he counted all of that as dung, as filth. He, he did not think of any of that as important to him anymore because of his love and his vision for Jesus Christ. That's, that's the prayer. That's what I have. If we're going to have successful plans... It'll be because we love God and we desire to glorify God and we've killed our, our little plans for ourselves and for others that are meaningless. Continue with me. He gives one more illustration here. Verse 31. Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage, and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whoso, listen to this. Uh, those two verses make you think a little bit of Absalom, don't they? Absalom sought out counselors as to how to defeat his father. But the problem there was, Absalom had sin in his camp. He was not, doing, he was not seeking the Lord. It was not for a godly purpose. But even those who are seeking the Lord and, and for a godly purpose are setting out to battle better count the costs in light of God's word, in light of prayer. But look at verse 33 and how he closes out these two, these two illustrations. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. So the, the, the instruction there is, you better plan to lose everything you have, family and your, your own life, to follow me. But the reward is so great to follow Jesus and walk with him and to know him intimately every day and to be in the kingdom of God and have that righteousness and peace and joy in the Lord. He's already saved us eternally. I believe everybody in here understands that. The Lord has already bought his people and paid for them on the cross whenever he died on the cross and he said it is finished he purchased us and we are saved in an eternal sense but those people who are his people who he has filled who he has caused to be born of his spirit those people have to choose to follow him in order to feel his love every day to to know him intimately every day and to walk with him each day and for us to do that the cost is great and we better plan for that we will be like the parable of the seeds that are thrown. If we aren't prepared to lose everything we have, the cares of this world will choke us out and we'll stop following Jesus. Turn with me to Psalm 20. Psalm 20, the 20th Psalm. I know we know these things, and I could just declare to you, you know the Bible says, trust not in your riches. Trust not in your stored up guns and ammunition. Trust not in your food. But let's read it from the Word of God. Psalm 20, verse 7 and 8. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Some trust in their mighty things that they have, but we will trust in the might of God who can just, and all of those things that we have are gone. You remember the parable of the man who had his storehouses full of his wheat. He thought, what will I do? I'll just make myself merry. I have more wheat stored up in these houses than I could possibly ever use. And the next day his life was required of him and all of that went to waste. Turn with me to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. 
1 Timothy chapter 6, beginning in verse 17. Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come. You see the planning? There is planning here, but it's not re relying on the riches. If, if we're rich in this world, we too often will relax, actually. We won't plan anymore, and we will rely on those riches instead of looking to God for the plan of, of setting up for ourselves being rich in good works toward God and serving Him for the time to come. Because there's a time to come. We have times where God comes and He uh, purges us with fire. And if we have wood and stubble and all of these, these uh, wicked things in our hearts and in our, in our lives, well, He'll remove them. And we need to seek the Lord before those times come and prepare for the times where we will go through hard, difficult times and, and be tried and be purged in the fire. Or else, God can come and if all we have left in our hearts is wickedness in a, in a timely sense, then he will put us through a hell on earth as a judgment because we have not prepared for the Lord coming back periodically in our lives to take account. So he says to prepare, look at verse 19 again, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. And that eternal life is here now. It's the abundant life. Eternal life is to know God and to know Jesus Christ in the same way as Brother Clay mentioned this morning, that knowledge is a love of God like a husband and a wife. The same way the Bible says that Adam knew Eve his wife and they conceived and bare a son. That intimate knowledge of God. If we, we desire that, then we need to lay up good works, seek the Lord, die to ourselves every day, and make plans in light of God's direction. And not trust in our riches or trust in our horses. Now, turn with me while we're here in the New Testament to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. We're trying to consider here making plans in light of God's word and not trusting in ourselves and our own plans. James chapter 4 gives a very clear uh, direction for how we ought to speak about our plans for the future and our plans for tomorrow. Look with me at James chapter 4 beginning in verse 13. Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Do y'all see the, the fleshly plan he has here? He's, he, this man that speaks this way, which is us, <laughs> way too often, this man that speaks this way says, I, I, all right, I, I've got this plan, and tomorrow I'm going to go here, and I'm going to buy and sell this thing in this town, and I'll go here, and, and look how much gain I'm going to get from that, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to build up this thing, and then I'll be set. Y'all see the planning that's happening? And we do this too often. Whenever God blesses us to be successful, that's whenever we need to be the most cautious. Because at that time we think, oh, well, we've got this the next time. Remember Jericho and Ai. Jericho, God blessed them. They got lazy in the Lord, and they were defeated at the small town of Ai. It happens to us all too often. And whenever God blesses us, we need to give him the glory, acknowledge him, and continue to seek him. Somebody told me uh, not too long ago, uh, just a couple of days ago, they were talking about how that, that saying that I believe there's truth in this saying, it's not from the Bible, but there is a pattern in the Bible of this happening where um, good men create good times. Strong men create good times. Good times can create weak men. That's what I'm warning against. Whenever God blesses you, it's easier. It's, we're prone to get weak in those times because we, we, we feel like we, we succeeded. So good times can create weak men. Then weak men can create bad times. And bad times create strong men. And you see it in the nation of the children of Israel. 
when God blesses them and gives them a leader, and then they serve the Lord, and they, they, God blesses them to defeat these massive enemies, then they forget God, and they become unthankful in their hearts. And then God allows, God does it now, and remember how God defeated the good counsel that was given to Absalom. God will defeat good counsel. So even if you think you've got good counsel in those high times, if we forget God and we're unthankful, God will defeat the good counsel and they'll be driven to terrible times. And they, will, they were given over into being, uh, being slaves to, to other nations and serving other nations. And then they were in such a desperate state that they remembered God and sought the Lord and God heard their prayers and gave them another judge, or gave, gave them another man who would seek the Lord, and God would bless them out of that time. And then they would fall again, and it was this over and over again. That pattern is biblical. But it doesn't have to be. There can be a remnant, there is a remnant that God preserves, and God gives us the choice in those good times to continue to plan in God's way, seeking the Lord for His glory, not, to, not just to avoid the bad times, because if that's what our motivation is, is to avoid the hard times, God will give us those hard times. You remember the children of Israel before they went into, before they went in to the promised land. Their fear was that their children would die because of these great giants and great walled cities. And God showed them the opposite. They died in the wilderness and their children lived and went into the promised land and defeated those giants. So our motivation is very important whenever we're trying to serve the Lord in our plans. And again, we deceive ourselves too often to think our motivations are good. Search your heart. Pray, search your heart. God knows it already. You may not even know it. Search your heart for what your motivation truly is. James chapter 4. We'll read verse 13 again. Go to now ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor. We need to keep that in mind, what we really are, and how small we really are, how frail we really are, how his ways are higher than our ways in such a way that we can't even comprehend it. We are just a vapor. We don't know anything without the Lord blessing us. It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. That's the instruction. And some of you might, uh, might think it's... Uh, well, this, this is the flesh in me that thinks... I, I get embarrassed sometimes. I answer all my emails... Every time I say something, I say, to, to the business people that I'm talking to, I say, the Lord willing, we will order this. Or the Lord willing, we will finish this on this time. And I, sometimes I think, this, this person I'm talking to is not a child of God. But that's me being ashamed. If I, if I give in to that, that would be me being ashamed of the Lord. The Lord tells me to say, if the Lord wills. Now, he tells you something else in there that I confess to you I don't do often enough. I try to thank it. I need to say it. He doesn't say to say if the Lord wills. He says, if the Lord wills, I'll go to this town, and if I live. Now there's an important reason for that, because our life is a vapor. Think about what that would do to your heart if you really considered you might not live tomorrow. How would you live the rest of your life today if you really had that in your mind, that the Lord is the only one giving me my next breath? You see how foolish we are in our considering that we have this next breath ourselves. Now, I might seek the Lord on this big thing over here that's a big problem, but you know, tomorrow, I've got tomorrow. Tomorrow's easy. I've already done that. We're foolish. Seek the Lord and acknowledge Him in our words and in our hearts. Uh, look at the next verse with me. We ought to say that if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. I think one of the primary reasons we plan in an ungodly way is our pride. And we need to consider that. Turn with me quickly to Second Chronicles chapter 20. Second Chronicles chapter 20. Consider Matthew 6. We won't turn there because I believe all of you, all of you are familiar with that. In the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus declares unto us, 
multiple things in there. In Matthew 6, I encourage you to read it. He talks about not trusting in your riches. And then right after that, he talks about not worrying about tomorrow. Not worrying. Uh, and that's different than planning in the Lord. But we worry about all the destruction, all the chaos that's going to happen. We often, too often forget God. We're forgetting God if we're worrying. If we're full of anxiety and fear over tomorrow, then it's not a godly spiritual state to be in. We need to be considering the Lord, knowing that the Lord is almighty and powerful, and He, he uh, takes care of His people. And His plans will prevail. We need to seek His plans. But it says, don't worry. And it says at the end of that verse, seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first God and His kingdom. And all these needs we have will be taken care of. Now notice the word first in there. Seek first the kingdom of God. You still ought to plan. I don't want us to fall into a ditch where we don't do anything to prepare for hard times. But seek first the Lord. Alright, Second Chronicles chapter 20. Again, for time's sake, we'll just read one verse here. But this is where King Jehoshaphat is met with an impossible situation where multitudes, three armies, are coming up against the children of Israel. And he does the perfect thing here to seek the Lord. And he, he prays to God Almighty. And, and look at the wording here in verse 12. Jehoshaphat is praying, O our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might. You see how he acknowledges he has no strength of his own. We have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do. How many times have we all felt that way before? How many times? I know many in here. I don't know what to do. I see this problem ahead. I know I'm not strong enough to handle it. And I have no clue what to do next. Well, this is our instruction, what Josh Fett said. He acknowledged that too. He has no might, and neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. We need to pray and seek the Lord for the plans in our lives, or else they'll be defeated. If we go on thinking we've got this, they will be defeated. And it'll be because it's not the right motivation, and we are prideful thinking we can do it on our own. In closing, we have a couple minutes. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3, three beginning in verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Don't lean on our own understanding. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord, and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. That's my prayer for Christ's sake. I would like to, uh, Brooks, I'm going to put you on the spot. I would like for uh, Brooks, if you will, I'll come up here with you. Brooks came up with a song for this, this passage. Proverbs 3, <laughs> you okay, Brooks? <laughs> Proverbs 3, 5 uh, through 8. And I try to teach it to my children. And I think it's good for all of us to hear and all of us to learn and have this song in our heart as we walk through each day. So, Briggs, if you'll come up. And uh, any children, Elliot, if you would like to come, and Adeline, if she's in here, if y'all come up and help us sing this. It's trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Y'all come sing this with us, and then we'll close. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And lean not unto thy own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thy own eyes. Fear the Lord. Depart from evil, it shall be held to thy navel.